This morning, we continue with our series that we've just entitled Divine Illustrations. And this series is about the parables that Jesus taught. Now, these parables are very, very well known. We've either taught them at Sunday school, even at school, and it's become part of our language to make the statement, a good Samaritan or my child is sometimes like the prodigal son, or that person's like a lost sheep. We use these terms, so we know the parables. But often we just know them superficially. We don't focus on the context. And as a church, and especially as the pastor, my responsibility is to be faithful to the truth. My responsibility is not to make things palatable. Neither is my responsibility for, for you to feel, oh, well, that really spoke to me today. That's very nice, and I'm going to go home. My responsibility is to be faithful to the text and faithful to the truth. And therefore, when we look at the parables, it's important for us to see what the context is around the parable and why Jesus shared this parable. Now, today, we are entering in to a very important chapter of the Bible and, and, and probably some of the most well-known parables all combined in Matthew chapter 13. And today we are going to deal with the sower. So the sower, and I invite you to turn with me to Matthew chapter 13. We're going to read from verse 1 to 23 of the sower. And I do tread very lightly today because it really is a challenging passage. And I'm going to try and be respectful, especially of those who might disagree with me on this, because you will read many commentaries, you will read many books, many daily devotionals have even been built around the sower. So I don't mean to, to sound contrarian or just be difficult, but we really want to look at what Jesus is saying and what the truth of the passage is. And that we will focus on over the next uh, three to four weeks as we look through Matthew chapter 13. So reading from verse 1. On the same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat by the sea, and a great multitudes were gathered together to him, so that he got into a boat and sat, and the whole multitude stood on the shore. Then he spoke many things to them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went out to sow. As he sowed, some seed fell by the wayside, and, and the birds came and devoured them. Some fell in the stony places, where they did not have much earth, and they immediately sprang up because they had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. And some fell among the thorns, and the thorns sprang up and choked them. But others fell on good ground and yielded crops, some hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. He who has ears, let him hear. And the disciples came and said to him, Why do you speak to them in parables? And he answered and said to them, because it has been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. Whoever has, to him more will be given, and he will have abundance. But whoever does not have, even that or what he has will be taken away from him. Therefore, I speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. And in them the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled, which says, Hearing you will hear and shall not understand, and seeing you will see and not perceive. For the hearts of this people have grown dull. Their ears are hard of hearing. Their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears. Lest they should understand with their hearts and turn, so that I should heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For assuredly, I say to you that many prophets and righteous men desire to see what you see and did not see it, and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. Therefore, hear the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, then the wicked one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is he who received seed by the wayside. But he received the seed on the stony places. This is he who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he no, has no root in himself, but endures only for a while. For when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, immediately 
he stumbles. Now he receives seed among the thorns is he who hears the word and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and he becomes unfruitful. But he receives seed on the good ground is he who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and produces some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Now Matthew chapter 13 is probably the most quoted chapter when we're dealing with parables but i also believe probably the most misunderstood and and i say that not to say well i know something that no one else knows please that's not it it's just the context especially here when we read the text everyone focuses on the first 13 verses and then of course the interpretation here from from verse 17 but do you see from verse 14 and 15 it quotes from isaiah and look at the, what it says. It says that at the end of this passage, that um, the ears of the people have grown dull. Who are the people here? How, how would you say to the world out there, people living in these houses who don't know the Lord, who are spiritualist cement trucks, many of them, I'm going to go to them saying, your ears are dull of hearing. Who, who, who's Jesus speaking about here and who's Isaiah speaking to when he speaks of ears being dull, eyes not seeing and needing healing? It's the children of Israel, not so? That immediately should tell you. And that's important. So I'm not trying to be as a contrarian or difficult. I'm saying I'm looking at this, asking the question, who is he speaking to? Because many have interpreted these parables as a picture of the church age and a picture of evangelism. Now, I don't believe the sower is dealing with evangelism at all. But I remember very clearly when I received the Gideon's Bible that they had the picture in the front of the Bible of they always have the sower with the big bag of seed. Have you seen that? And the sower throws the seed. Now, of course, the sower, according to verse 37, is uh, the son of man, the Lord Jesus Christ. And of course, the seed is the word of God. That's definite. But what is being sown? To whom is it being sown? When is it sown? And for what purpose is it being sown? That's the question I've got to ask. So I don't believe this is a picture of the church age at all. Now, we're not going to be able to dig into that in much detail in this message. But I will just say that, and if you disagree, that's fine. But I think the context tells you something very specific in the whole of chapter 13. Now, for us to be accurate in interpreting these verses, we have to look at the full picture of God's word, the full counsel, and be consistent. That's all that I want for God's people is for us to be consistent. When a word is used in a certain context and is used again in the same context, we must be consistent. We can't change words. To use an example, there are many people in the Christian church who say that Israel doesn't exist anymore as, as the people of God. They're, they're not the covenant people anymore. And every time you read the word Israel in the New Testament, it's actually speaking about the church. Now, how can you say that? So when it says Israel, it's not Israel, it's actually the church. So you're basically changing the meaning of a word. We can't change meanings of the word. We can't. We have to be consistent. Once again, we have to ask the question in reading the text, and I leave this with you. If you're new to our church, I'm sorry, I, I do tend to sort of, oh, he's going on. And you, go, you know, I've got this beautiful, wife, wonderful wife, but I'm also, inverted commas, connected to the church, and everyone here is like my wife sometimes when I speak, they're like, oh, he goes on again. Here he goes. So I'm going to go on again. You're going to maybe roll your eyes. But when we look at the text, we have to ask key questions. Firstly, who is speaking? To whom are they speaking? When was it said? And what is being said? So who is speaking? That's, of course, the Lord Jesus Christ. To whom is he speaking? He's speaking to Israel. That's clear from the context. When is it said? Has Jesus died yet? No. So it's before the cross. And then what's being said? And that's what we're going to look at now today. So the parable of the sower is key to understanding the meaning of the whole of the chapter. And we're going to deal with all of these things. We've got the wheat and the tares. We've got the, the, um, the, lo the treasure and the pearl of great price and all those things we're going to deal with. But Matthew 13, the key that unlocks the whole chapter is the sower. Because it tells you who the, what, who the dynamics are of the, pas the passage in the bigger sense. So what is the field or... You know, who is the sower? And, and it tells you who those things are. What are the birds? 
because you've got the birds here. The birds here are bad. The best example of bad birds is Alfred Hitchcock's The Birds. So if you think, if you read The Birds here, think Alfred Hitchcock, The Birds. It's a terrifying movie. All right. So it's important. So let's look at two connected passages because the so is used twice in the other Gospels. Mark chapter 4 and also Luke chapter 8. I just want to quote Mark chapter 4 verse 13. So Mark chapter 4 verse 13. And, and, and I'm just quoting here because this is what Jesus is saying, that you must understand the first part to this par these parables to understand the parables. And it says here in, in, in Mark 4.13, he said to them, do you not understand this parable, which is the sower? If you don't understand this one, how would you understand all the other parables? It's key. But the passage I really want to connect you with is Luke chapter 8. So turn with me to Luke chapter 8. And Luke, of course, critics of the Bible that don't know the Bible always say, oh, the Gospels are different. Yes, of course they're different because they're for a purpose. If every Gospel, I mean, that's, I just love that. Can you imagine if all the Gospels were exactly the same? You know what that means? Someone just went, vroom, vroom, just ran off copies. The whole point of why the Gospels are different is four different authors written for four different purposes with four different aspects that are highlighted. It's important. So the critics that say to me, oh, the Gospels are not the same. Some mention other things and leave other things out. Yes, because the Bible's not trying to be a copy. It's a truth document. So let's look at, at Luke 8, verse 4 to 15, which, of course, is the sower. And when a great multitude had gathered and they had come to him from every city, he spoke by a parable. A sower went out to sow his seed, and as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and it was trampled down, and the birds of the air, remember, devoured it. Some fell on rock, as, and as soon as it sprang up, it withered away because it lacked moisture. Very interesting, moisture. It's another connection to what Matthew doesn't speak about, moisture, but here it mentions moisture. And some fell among the thorns, and the thorns sprang up with it and choked it. But others fell on the good ground and sprang up and yielded a crop hundredfold. When he had said these things, he cried, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Very interesting for those who are interested in the book of Revelation, you'll find that statement is used for the seven churches. He that has ears, let him hear. Very interesting. But I just leave that with you for those who are interested. Then his disciples asked him, saying, what does this parable mean? He said, to you it has been given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to the rest it is given in parables. See, that says kingdom of God, yeah, and Matthew says kingdom of heaven. The reason why is the same. It's just Matthew focuses very specifically on the um, kingship of Christ, and therefore kingdom of heaven is connected to a messianic term for the king. So that's why Matthew uses that, but it means the same thing. And it says here, seeing that they may not see and hearing they may not understand. Verse 11. Now, this par now the parable is this. The seed is the word of God. Those who by the wayside are ones who hear. Then the devil comes, birds, and takes away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. But the ones on the rock are those who, when they hear, they receive the word with joy. And these have no root to believe for a while and in, in time of temptation fall away. Very important, fall away. Now the ones that fell among the thorns are those who, when they have heard, go out and are choked with cares, riches, and pleasures of life and bring no fruit to maturity. Very, very important. Please remember this. Fall away. And maturity, very important. Verse 15, but the ones that fell on the good ground are those who, having heard the word with a noble and good heart, keep it and bear fruit with patience. Very important. So it gives us more insight there. So coming back to Matthew 13, we must be clear on a few things. Two things that are very, very important in understanding this parable. What is the gospel of the kingdom? And what is the kingdom? Those two things. So what is the gospel of the kingdom and what is the kingdom? Now, I'm going to share this importantly to you because what's happening is in Christianity today, the term kingdom 
has been changed. When you read the Old Testament, the Old Testament is very clear on what the kingdom is. But what's happening in Christianity is because the kingdom did not come. And how do I know the kingdom did not come? Have you seen our world? Is this the kingdom of God? It's wonderful, isn't it? It's fantastic. I, I, I encourage you to walk down the streets of Paris late at night and see what happens. Okay. So what's happening in Christianity is because the kingdom not come and they don't understand that, people have spiritualized the kingdom. So everyone says we're living in a spiritual kingdom. And so what happens is every time they think kingdom, they think spiritual, and we move away from what the Bible says. Because the Old Testament is very clear. What is the kingdom of God? In the Old Testament, it is clear the kingdom is the physical reign of the Lord Jesus Christ from Jerusalem with a rod of iron, and all the nations will be in subjection to him. That is the promise. Zechariah chapter 14 says his feet will touch the Mount of Olives. That's not spiritual. That's literal. It says that when his feet touches the Mount of Olives, the Mount of Olives will split in two. That's physical. So suddenly now in Christianity, because of certain theological views, every time you pick up a book, oh, we're living in this wonderful spiritual kingdom. Are these people insane? Have you been in the church? How long have you been in the church? I've been in the church for 23 years, full-time ministry. It's not very nice always. Christians can't even get along. We can't even create this utopia within the church. We're not living in a utopia. We're not living in a kingdom. The kingdom is still to come, and I long for that day when we're released from this stuff. I can actually move away from this body of sin that binds us and causes problems at times. It's still coming, and I look forward to that, but we're not in it now. So the, the kingdom, when you read kingdom, like the birds, I oh, think birds bad. Kingdom, physical, physical, not just the spiritual. But also when we speak about the gospel, what is the gospel? The term gospel is good, good news, good news. But I'm going I'm to share this with you. I think it's pretty logic. I don't know. Some people think it's, it's very deep. Had Jesus died it when he spoke this parable? No. So you have to do this. He hadn't. So do you think that when Jesus spoke of the gospel, he spoke of his death and resurrection? So what gospel was he sharing? Because everyone thinks the gospel is solely the death and resurrection of Christ. Is that the gospel now? Yes, it is. 100%. I'm not saying it's not. But Jesus hadn't died yet. Only in Matthew 16 are the disciples aware he's going to die. So what was the gospel that he's talking about here? I'm going to leave it with you to think through. Because everyone assumes Jesus went around saying, you know, I'm going to die and I'm going to rise again. No one knew that until it happened. Even Peter took Jesus aside. It's so funny, Peter. It makes me laugh. Sometimes I feel like Peter, but sort of impulsive. Jesus says, I'm going to die. And Peter takes him aside saying, no, it's not going to happen. <laughs> and then Jesus calls him Satan. So we have to ask the question, what is the gospel here? Because gospel just means good news. What was the good news at the time? The good news was the Messiah is here and the kingdom is to come. It's good news, isn't it? Guess what? The blind see, the deaf hear, the mute speak, the lame walk. It's great news. Demons are cast out. That's the gospel. So turn with me to Matthew chapter 10, verse 5 to 7. Matthew 10, 5 to 7. Because Jesus clearly teaches here the gospel of the kingdom. What is the gospel of the kingdom? So Matthew 10 verse 5 says, These twelve Jesus sent out and commanded them, saying, Do not go into the way of Gentiles, which is you. If it's not you, you know, Mazel Tov and all those things, but it's us. Do not go to the city of the Samaritans, but rather go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as you go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. What is that kingdom? It's the earthly reign of Christ. The Messiah is now here, and the kingdom is in your midst, and the kingdom is at hand. Did the kingdom come? No. That's a different question. Why didn't it come? And it's very clear why it didn't come, because the people that he came for rejected him. He came to his own. His own did not receive him. But again, that's another theological discussion. But the key here is that the gospel of the kingdom is that the Messiah is here. When you go to Matthew 16, don't turn there. I'm just going to share this with you. So Jesus asks the disciples, who do men say that I am? And Peter says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. 
What, what does Christ mean? What is the term for Christ in Hebrew is Messiah. So at the time of Jesus, they wouldn't have said Jesus Christ. They would have said Yeshua Mashiach. So what was Peter saying? You are the Messiah. That's the good news, that Jesus is the Messiah. So what is the gospel in Christ's ministry? It's the gospel of the kingdom. There's no cross there yet. It's the gospel of the Messiah. What is the kingdom of heaven? It is the physical kingdom that's going to come to earth. What is the Lord's Prayer? We all should know the Lord's Prayer. If you don't, then I don't know if you're a Christian. I'm kidding. Um, but the Lord's Prayer, on earth as it is in, which is the kingdom, that the longing of the Lord's Prayer is that heaven comes to earth. So the gospel is the gospel of the kingdom. The kingdom is the physical reign of Christ on earth. What are the mysteries of the kingdom? Now, again, I'm going to ask. It's, just, it's difficult. If the text says the mysteries of the kingdom, how is this Christianity? I don't understand. Does it just mean? If something says mysteries of the kingdom, what's it relating to? The kingdom. It doesn't say Christianity, but suddenly what's happened is the mystery of the kingdom now is about Christianity. You know, what are the mysteries of the kingdom? The mysteries of the kingdom are the spiritual deep dynamics of what will precede the coming of the kingdom. That's what it is. That in the midst of the people, while Jesus is there, while he's preaching, while the 12 are going out, there are spiritual dynamics that will take place that, that anticipates the coming of the Messiah. And this is important. All the things that are spiritually preparing people for the kingdom, that's what the mysteries of the kingdom are. So let's move on. So the parable of the sower is unique. And Jesus himself gives us the interpretation that makes it unique. Because many of the other parables, we have to sort of look at the context and draw from there. But this, the parable of the sower, Jesus himself gives us the interpretation of what it is. So I leave this with you to ponder through. As we look at the four seed or the four soils, same seed, but the four soils, as the seed falls, I don't believe that this parable is specifically dealing with salvation. That's still coming. I don't believe it's dealing with salvation. I believe it's dealing with something specific relating to fruit bearing. Jesus is using the sower to explain that the seed's going to fall and will some will heal healed fruit and some won't. And he's encouraging the disciples to know that as you go out and you are preaching, there will be some that respond positively to the message of the kingdom and others who will struggle with the message of the kingdom. But it's not saying they're saved or not because not everyone that was saved followed Jesus. How do I know that? Because Jesus himself spoke about discipleship that was difficult to follow him. Some people believed but didn't follow and, and how can you say that? And I said this in our Bible study on Friday. So please tell me how many of the disciples stuck around to the cross when Jesus was crucified. How many of them stayed around? Where did they go? Did they ran or were they so committed, strong for Jesus people? They all ran. Only John stuck around because it was difficult. Physically, the man asked, can I go home and just wait for my inheritance? And Jesus says, No. Let the dead bury the dead. You follow me. Sell all you have and follow me. It was extreme because it was the time of the Messiah. It's difficult. It's not the same language as we have in the New Testament. Paul says, look after your family, have a job, work and provide. So it's a completely different context. So the question here is about fruit bearing and growing and showing your discipleship through following and bearing fruit. It's not got to do with if the person is saved or not. But we're going to look at the four seed as I speak. I leave this with you to think through. Turn with me to Matthew 24, verse 14. So Matthew 24, verse 14. So the gospel of the kingdom was preached at the time of Christ. Why? Because the Messiah was here. The king was here on earth 2,000 years ago, and the king was preaching about the kingdom and preparation for the kingdom. The kingdom did not come 
because Israel rejected the kingdom and that's in abeyance until the future. And the promise is that the kingdom will still come and Israel will still enter into a very special position with God. That's in the future. But the gospel of the kingdom is about the hope of the kingdom and the Messiah and him setting up the kingdom. That's, that's the message of the kingdom. Will the gospel of the kingdom be preached again? Yes, it will. Do we today preach the gospel of the kingdom? No, we don't. Why? Because we're waiting for the return of the Lord and the rapture of the church to take us home. And when he takes us home, which I'm very excited about, by the way, when he takes us home, what happens after that? The Bible then says a time of tribulation starts, seven years according to the book of Revelation. Now, some don't believe in that, and that's fine. But that's what I believe the scriptures teach. Christ comes, removes the church, the tribulation starts. What gospel is going to be preached in the tribulation? What's the hope of the tribulation? What are they longing for? The kingdom to come. So they're longing for Jesus to return and set up his kingdom. And there's all the difficult things that are happening. So the gospel that will be preached in the tribulation will be the gospel of the cross, yes, but also the gospel of the expectation of the kingdom to come. When you look at Matthew 24, let's look at verse 13 and 14. And do your, I encourage you to read the whole of Matthew 24. I just can just draw from it now. And Jesus speaks here about the future and what is to come. And he says in verse 13, but he who endures to the end shall be saved. That saved there is not spiritual, it is physical, because he's talking about the tribulation, struggling through the tribulation. Verse 14, and this gospel of the kingdom we preach in all the world as a witness to all the nations. And then what? The end will come. So you preach the gospel of the kingdom in anticipation of the end, which will come in the future. And therefore, it is not the same as the gospel we share today, because the gospel we share is salvation through Christ with the hope of going to heaven, not the hope of the kingdom being established on earth yet. That's why it's different. Oh, how can you say that? It's in the scriptures. So let's look at the sower. The sower, according to verse 37 when you turn with me to Matthew 13, verse 37, it says, the sower here is the son of man. So in verse 37, it says, he answered and said to them, he who sows the good seed is the son of man. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, it's quite interesting because everyone thinks that we sow the seed. I'm not saying we don't sow seed because, of course, in the book of 1 Corinthians 3, it says that I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So nothing wrong with the principle of sowing seed but the question is, in this specific parable, who is the sower? It's Jesus in this specific parable. Now, you can try and say, well, it's, it's us. It's fine. You can say that, but it's not what the parable is saying. The parable is clear. Who is the sower? So let's look at here. If you look at the text, let's go to the first seed. I'm going to try and, you know, we have to look at this from verse 4. It says, and as he sowed some seed, it fell by the wayside and the birds came and devoured them. So the first seed that is sown falls by the wayside on the sides. And the birds come and snatch the seed away. Now we know that the birds is connected to evil and Satan. And so some will hear the message of the kingdom. And that seed will be planted. But it will be snatched very quickly. It won't grow. Because they're not interested and the, the devil will snatch that away. It's also quite interesting. Sorry, I just want, before I continue, just for those who are strongly sort of Calvinistic, I find this passage very interesting. Because if people believe it's only the sovereignty of God that gets people saved, what is the emphasis here in the, in the, in the parable? Is the emphasis on the sower or on the, the soil? So I'm very, I'm very interested with, with the strong sort of, you know, super Calvinistic bashes. I'm saying, poof, this parable just basically cuts and Calvin must go home now. Because this is saying that it's dependent upon the soil, not the, not the sower. Nothing in the passage here says God creates sovereignly the seed to grow. It says that depending on the soil, the seed grows or not. I just leave that with you to think through. Because I don't believe it's about salvation anyway, but I'm just saying it's very, very interesting. So yeah, the first seed that is planted is suddenly snatched away by the bird or the birds, by Satan. That's the first seed. So the one, this is the one where there's no growth, there's no interest, there's nothing happening. It's the second, the third, the fourth seed that becomes interesting. And this is where there's going to be an application right at the end for us, because I think there are some, some things for us to apply. 
So we move on. And we move to verse 5. And it says, some fell on the stony places. So the stony places will be places where there's rock and a bit of soil. So some fell on the stony places where they did not have much earth. And they immediately sprang up because they had no depth of earth. Now that sounds very negative, doesn't it? But when you read Luke, it's not as negative. It's basically just saying there wasn't enough moisture. There was a little bit of soil, so it grew quickly. But it didn't have longevity in its growth. So some fell in the stony places and, and so basically sprang up very quickly. And verse 6 then says, And when the sun was up, they were scorched because they did not have root and they withered away. Now, when you look at, the, at what Luke is saying, Luke is saying they fell away. They fell away. Now, what's interesting about the second seed is that if you look at Luke, so if you turn with me to Luke, so Luke 8. I'm trying to find these. Sorry, I didn't type them in. Yeah, verse um, 13. Look at verse 13 of Luke 8. It says, but the ones on the rock are those who, when they hear, receive what? With joy. So they receive the word. They're excited about it. But they have no root. There's no growth. There's no longevity. And they believe for a while. And when, they, when temptation comes, they fall away. What does fall away mean? Because according to Matthew, they fall away because of persecution. Is that not every single one of the disciples? Because if you want to use the thinking there, when, tr when trouble came, where were the disciples to be found? At the cross or at home? Because what the second seed is, it's not saying that the people who receive the seed here, just because there's no root and there's no growth, that they're not saved. What it means is they start off well, but as soon as there's trouble and persecution and difficulty, they sort of shy away. Because what was discipleship about? Being prepared to give your life. Not so. And so we can draw this into from a Christian perspective, because some people hear the word, they start off well, but as soon as it starts becoming difficult, they sort of drift a bit. And even in the ministry of Christ, people drifted. I mean, I used this on Friday. It was so interesting because when you look at the disciples in the book of John, when the disciples ran away, who was the one that brought them back in? Did they go, you know what, we were wrong, we have to get back in? No, because the Bible says they actually went fishing, by the way. Who was the one who brought them back in? Jesus. He went to visit them again. So when Peter denied the Lord three times, who gave him an opportunity three times to affirm Christ again? Jesus. So what Jesus is just saying here with the second seed is that the seed's going to go out and some people are going to look excited initially, but as soon as trouble comes and persecution comes and difficulties come, they are going to fall away. doesn't mean they're not saved. It just means they don't have the conviction to take a stand with you. Don't be too bothered. Don't be too concerned. That's going to happen. And it's the same for us, even as Christians. We have people among us who are not going to be as committed because of various reasons, because it's difficult. The Christian walk is difficult at times. So yeah, the second seed falls. There's a bit of growth. It looks good. But as soon as the sun comes up, as soon as there's a bit of pressure, they don't continue. And, it, and the falling away is very important because falling away basically means to go astray. It doesn't mean initially to fall out of salvation. It just means that they go astray. And there are many, many believers, of course, in the context here, but also in the, in the Christian church, there are many believers who have gone astray because of difficulties. Let's go to the third seed. And this one's very interesting. This is the Marlow seed. And it says... And some fell among the thorns, and the thorns sprang up and choked them. And, who, and if you go on here to verse, um, we, we're going to find that uh, verse 21, sorry, 22, sorry, 22. It says, now he who received the seed among the thorns is he who hears the word and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of what? Riches. Choke the word, and he becomes un.
unfruitful. Why does it use the term unfruitful? It doesn't say it's unsaved. It says unfruitful. Because the context here is that there are many that followed, but as soon as the, the consequence of riches, of selling all you have came to the fore, because I think all of us can agree, are you saved because you've sold everything? No. We say by believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. Some people believed in him as the Messiah, but they weren't willing to sell everything they have because they, it was difficult for them. So I, I think that the logic is very difficult for us to draw immediately and say, well, no, no, these people are saved. What Jesus is saying is that discipleship comes at a cost and some people weren't willing to count the cost. And so what happens is they believe, but as soon as they realize the magnitude of what they're going to lose maybe or the riches of this world, they become distracted with things. Then what happens? It chokes them. It chokes them. And they become unfruitful. They don't bear fruit anymore. And the question is, has that happened to us? And I think why I call it the Marlowe verse is because when there, we live in wealthy places or affluent areas, the riches of this world choke people, don't they? It happens. I prayed to the Lord and he gave me this wonderful new job. I've become the CEO of this massive company. And guess what? I'm not going to be in church every Sunday now. And I'm going to be away from my family for a long time. But I've been so blessed by the Lord by this job. But we prayed for it, didn't we? We prayed for this big job to take me away from my family and to cause me to not grow spiritually. The Lord is amazing. Because now I've got a big car, better house, and it's wonderful. Because that's the great desire people have, not so. I want, to, I want to be affluent. I want to have money. I want to have these blessings. And it's wonderful. It's great. And I've prayed about it. And God needs to give me things. Because, you know, he's got wonderful plans for me. And his plans are for me to prosper. And we all clamor after more things. We become like little magpies, like birds. And we just want to gather gold and silver and precious stones and live on these little things that make us very happy. But it comes at a cost. It comes at a cost to our discipleship to have. Because what did Jesus say? It's more difficult for a rich man to enter in than a camel to go through the eye of a needle. It's quite interesting if you look at that. Some believe that the eye of the needle there is actually... In certain cities, they had small doors, like little hobbit doors, like, like Bissom. If you, if you drive down Bissom, it's like, where's the hobbits? Like the doors are this yay big. I'm expecting to see Gandalf there and the hobbits running around. It's like Middle Earth. And they believe that some of the towns had smaller little doors, and the only way for you to get in is to let go of all your possessions. Because you were carrying it on your back. And for me to get to the door, I need to let go. So to be a disciple, you had to let go of certain things. And riches was difficult. So it's difficult to follow the Lord like we should if we are concerned with riches. It's difficult to follow the Lord as we should if we are concerned with persecution. My neighbors don't like me. The people at school don't like me. I might lose my job. And those things are real worries. But if we are going to stand for Christ, we, we can't be concerned about what could happen to us. Even as a pastor, we need, I need support from you to be able to preach the word because the time might come where they will gag the preaching of the word. And as God's people, we need to encourage other to continue because it's going to be easy for me to sidestep certain things in case I get a knock at my door. Oh, it will never happen. Yes, of course, it won't, it won't ever happen. Don't worry. And so we come to the fourth seed. In verse 23, but he receives seed on the good ground is he who hears the word, understands it. Who indeed bears fruit. This is not talking about salvation. It's talking about fruit bearing. It's not talking about believing in Jesus. It's talking about your life manifesting fruit. And produces some 30-fold, some 60-fold, and some 30-fold. That's beautiful because it's all that you produce based upon what you are capable of producing. If we go back to Luke. 
Luke 8. I'm going to give you the verse. Try and get there. So Luke 8. Verse 15, but the ones who fell on the good ground and are those who have been heard the word with a noble and good heart. So who's got a noble and a good heart, by the way? I find this very interesting. Because the Bible says in the book of Jeremiah 17, verse 9, that the heart of man is wicked. That's so what I'm saying. This is not dealing with salvation. Because I'm asking, if I'm going to go preach the gospel to a heathen world out there, what the Bible then is saying that I'm preaching to some with a good heart. Do you see it's contradictory? And that's what I'm saying. I love the people that use this for evangelism. And I'm saying that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says that all of us are sinners and lost. Who creates the good heart in you? You or God? So what this is saying is that these people believe, then receive the message of the kingdom. And they respond, and some don't respond. That's what it's speaking about in the context here. So the seed that falls in the good ground are people that believe already. And once they hear of the Messiah, what do they do? And who are the examples of that? Peter's a great example. I use him quite often, especially shame with, with denying the Lord and running away. But let's look at Peter's life. What happened when he met the Messiah? What, when Jesus said to him, follow me, what did Peter do? Keep his nets or leave his nets? But do you know that Peter was saved before he met Jesus? I know. It's a controversy. And oh, you can hear the gasps. Peter had walked under the ministry of John the Baptist for a long time. And his brother Andrew. So that when he saw the Messiah, John the Baptist had preached, the Messiah is coming. When Peter saw him, what did he do? Oh, okay. <laughs> Here he is. Because Peter already, did Peter go to the Day of Atonement? Yes, he did. Did Peter keep the Passover? Yes, he did. Did Peter believe in the sacrifice of the Old Testament? Yes, he did. He was a believer. It's just when he saw the Messiah, it was like, oh, okay, there we go. Boom. So when Jesus is speaking, he's speaking to some who already believe. And so what happens to use the context here, of evan to use this for evangelism, is not understanding the context. When Jesus preached, he preached to many who already were believers. It's just that when they meet him, what's their response? That's what the sower is about in this context. We're still going to move to the wheat and the tares. That's completely different. It's just this context is more to do with believers and how they respond. The first one's an unbeliever. We can say that. That's fine. But two, three, and four is such an indication of believers. Those who aren't willing to always take a stand. Those who are choked by the concerns of this world and the others who bear fruit. So the question I leave with you is, which one are you this morning? You, not them. Absolutely nothing to do with them out there. It's got to do with us. The word's being preached. How do we respond? Some of us here aren't saved. I don't know who you are. I'm not looking at anyone. But maybe you're here this morning, you're not saved. Guess what? The bird's going to come. Seed's gone. Not concerned. But then the word's being preached. And some people, yes, you're excited. This is me. The second seed was me when I was a kid. I'm not saying I believe, but I, I grew up in the Pentecostal church. And we'd have these wonderful meetings. Like the songs were great. The pastor had his white socks on. You always know a pastor's on fire for God when he's got white socks with a suit. Man. I don't know why they did that. It was like, it was like a thing. White socks, and he's going to preach, and the hanky's coming out, and it's super on fire for God. And I was sitting there as, as an 11-year-old, and they were singing these wonderful songs, and we're clapping hands, and it's super in South Africa, by the way. We can, we can do Pentecostal. So I was very excited. And I remember sitting in the car going home saying, yes, I'm going to be at the prayer meeting on Wednesday night. I'm going to really live for the Lord as an 11-year-old. Guess what happens Monday morning? Emotion's gone. It's gone now. But you were keen. So some people come to church. We're keen because we hear, yeah, yeah, I really need to. And then Monday comes. And others are saying, yes, I'm going to live for the Lord. But then, oh, what about my job? And I need to look after the house. And these money worries. And, mm. and then others hear. And they're excited. And they hear. And they grow. And they produce fruit. That's the context of this parable fruit bearing 
So what's the application as we conclude? Some here and are not interested. Others here, and they start off well, but when trials and tribulation comes, then they struggle. Others believe, but riches and the things of this world distract them. And, and it's a real, I've seen this in, in the ministry. I've, when I've ministered to people, there are many people that are just really excited. You start walking with them, and especially those who are in need. So those who maybe don't have a job. Now in South Africa, when you don't have a job, it's a pretty serious thing. You know, people that come and they're really struggling and they need and they really want to grow and you pray with them and you counsel them and you help them and they just really, yeah, they're in the word. And then, guess what? I got a job. And when they got a job, do they need the counseling now? Do they need the help now? No, no, I got a job now. It's okay. No, I'm really going to serve the Lord. I'm going to come to church and yeah, be there still and I'm really excited and I love the Lord and... Sometimes they just drift away, and it happens. So the, the third seed are those who believe, but the world chokes them. Happens to young people, not so. Young people, you you have a you have a you know I don't say a rally, but you speak to young people. They come forward, they pray the Lord, you know the sinner's prayer, and you pray with them, and they love, they they keen, they excited, they confess their sins, and they accept the Lord Jesus Christ. And they're 18 years old and they really want to serve now in the youth ministry. And then they meet a girl. Don't they? And the girl they meet, not in church. But don't worry, I'm going to get her right. And then a year later, you don't get her right. But she drags you away. Or it could be a girl that meets a boy. And I'm going to get him right. Don't worry. I'm going to really get into church and he's going to, yeah, the Lord's going to work in his life. It happens to me at night, by the way. Harry is falling asleep in front of the TV now at night. It's holiday times. Guess who has to carry him to bed? <laughs> you know how difficult it is to pick someone up? He's eight years old and he's got those feet and he's the most beautiful face in the world. It's like this. And I've got to pick him up. And I have to carry him up those wonderful stairs. And put him in bed. Makes me feel very strong and manly, by the way. But it's more difficult for me to pick him up than for him to drag me down, not so. And that happens in many people's lives. They meet the wrong person or they get the wrong job. And that drags them down more than it lifts them up. And that's the third person. It happens. And then finally, those who hear and bear fruit. And I trust that all of us here are committed to bearing fruit. And how are we going to do that? You're not going to bear fruit by trying hard. The best way to bear fruit is to water the soil and feed the soil to grow. And how do we do that? Through the word of God. So if you want to grow, just allow God's word to flow over your soul. And God will produce the fruit. So therefore, the sower is specifically dealing with spiritual response and growth based upon the gospel of the kingdom. So I trust but we're all on the same page there as we go through Matthew 13. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for what has been shared this morning and how encouraging it is. Thank you, Lord, for your grace and mercy to us. And Father, we pray that you will help us to respond accordingly to your word. Help us to respond in bearing fruit, help us to be prepared to receive, help us to grow in your word, help us to be willing to, Holy Spirit, allow you to fill our lives with the word of God. And Lord, just help us as your people. For those of us who might be distracted by the things of this world, for others who might be scared and concerned about what others might think, we pray, Lord, for each other, that you will strengthen us. We are not here to be in judgment of each other. We are here for you, to encourage each other. All of us have burdens to carry. All of us have difficulties we face. But we turn to you, Lord. We look to you as the Savior and the Rescuer and the Helper. And we pray that you'll help us. So, Lord, I pray for each and every person that is here. And maybe there's someone among us, Lord, this morning, where the seed has been planted, but... I don't know. I don't get it. I don't understand. What is this all about? 
And I pray, Lord, for each and every person that is here, for that person that might be struggling, don't know what this is all about, what the gospel is. I pray for them that they will believe in you, Lord. They will trust that you were born, that you lived among us as humanity, that you died on the cross for our sins and that you rose again. I pray, Lord, that they will turn to you and that they will believe that you are the way, the truth, and the life. I pray for you today that that seed will not be snatched away, but that it will start to germinate and bear fruit. I pray for you today. In your wonderful name we pray, Lord, the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Please stand for our concluding song.